Hello, everyone. We are going to start now. Okay, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the foot model that we have developed for symmetry gate analysis. Uh, um, to, the, to the left, this is me, Prabhav Saraswat. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Bioengineering of University of Utah. Uh, Sebastian and Michael are here as a panelist, and Casper is hosting the webcast. Uh, they'll be helping me out throughout the presentation. At any point during the presentation, if you have a question, please, please feel free to ask them. To ask a question, you can type it. Uh, click on this button right here, which is a question mark, which will open a question and answer panel. You can type your questions in here, and please make sure that you send your questions to everyone, host, present, presenter, and the panelists, so everyone can see your question. We will be, uh, I'll be answering the questions after the end of the presentation. Uh, I'll have about 15 minutes to answer your question, so please feel free to ask questions at any point in the presentation. At this point, if you still cannot hear me, Please go to the nhbtech.com. At the bottom of the page, click on the link to check for upcoming webcast. And on that page at the bottom, you'll find the instructions to set up audio. It's a PDF file which you can download, which has instructions to set up audio. Once again, it's okay to ask questions. Make sure that you send your questions to everyone, host, presenter, and the panelist. Here is a brief outline of my presentation. I'll start by talking about the brief introduction of the gate analysis and why we are so interested in developing this foot model. Um, then I'll talk about the steps involved in developing this base model and then how we adjust and adapt this model for subject-specific applications. Finally, I'll talk about the model outcomes and compare with the other literature. And at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if you can hear me fine, you don't have to do anything, but if you still cannot hear me, please go through these links to reabilitech.com and then go to the link of check for upcoming webcast. And finally, you should be able to find the link for instructions to set up audio. Okay, let's start now. So, um, clinical gate analysis is a it's been a very important tool in clinical decision making and a quantitative assessment of surgical outcomes that is comparing the pre and post results uh, for subjects that we see here. And it's been, it's been used since 1980. What you see on the right here is a representation of a full body gait model. On the top there is the front, that's your hips, that's your upper leg, lower leg, and your feet. Each circle in this graph represent a mark which is fixed to the subject's body, and the motion of these marker trajectories is measured by the camera fixed onto the walls. The motion of each segment, for example, your upper leg is measured by three markers, one, two, and three. From there, you can measure the three dimensions motion of your leg, and from there, you can calculate how much each joint is moving during the walking. This uh, gait analysis is typically used with children with neuromuscular muscular, muscular diseases such as cerebral palsy and spina bifida, adults with strokes, and as well as um, looking at the efficacy of prosthetic devices. What I wanted to focus on here <coughs> is that the motion of the feet is measured by two markers only. The whole feet is assumed to be a single segment as if it's moving together. And the only motion which these two markers can measure is the ankle flexion of the ankle joint right here. This in turn ignores the motion which is happening within your feet, that is in the intrinsic joints of your feet. And most of the patients that we see, and we mostly see pediatric patients who, which are, who are affected by cerebral palsy, and most of them have significant foot deformities, as shown in these pictures here. For example, on the left, See, the medial arch of the forefoot is absent. This is characterized as flat feet. On the right, see the excessive values of the ankle. These kind of deformities cannot be measured by the current gait analysis model, which only puts two marks on the whole feet. Therefore, uh, in last about 10 years, there uh, have been a lot of effort into measuring the uh, intrinsic joints of the motion of the feet. 
um, in the last 20 years, the camera technology has evolved a lot. The resolution has increased. So that has given us two benefits. One is that we can measure the markers, which are much more smaller than they used to be. These are the smaller that we used to use about few years ago. And these are the small markers that you can see from the new camera system. And these markers are about 4 millimeter in diameter. Another one is that we can put the markers much closer to each other and it's still able to identify two separate markers. So that allows us to put a lot more marks on the feet and in turn allows us to measure the motion of the different segments of the feet. The current model that have been developed in our lab for the kinematic analysis of the feet has three segments of the feet. I'll talk about that in detail later on. Um, so what we want to do here is then update the musculoskeletal model. Musculoskeletal model, uh, as shown in anybody's websites, is driven by these marker trajectories. And since we only have two marks on the feet, the musculoskeletal model also assumes the feet to be a single segment. Now that we have the more kinematic data, we wanted to update that model to have more segments of the feet so that we can use that kinematic data into the musculoskeletal model. Um, what uh, we can achieve from the musculoskeletal model as in the clinical setting is that like how we can use that in our everyday clinical analysis. The current gear analysis that we do for each and every subject that comes to our lab involves kinetics, which is computing the joint movements for each joint of the leg, for example, hip and knee joint, while they're walking. What the musculoskeletal model can tell us is that which muscles are active to produce these movements so that we can understand the normal muscle activation pattern of the muscles during walking. Um, the potential model application, if we develop a more detailed model of the feet, will be that we will be able to detect muscle imbalance before deformity. What I mean by this statement here is that the deformities in the feet that I showed you earlier in a few pictures are usually a result of a muscle imbalance. And those in muscle imbalance lead to deformities. If we can detect those muscle imbalance before they lead to the deformity, we can check we can prevent them from happening and we can do the preventive measures before they reach a deformative stage. We can also simulate the surgical procedures such as calcaneus length link, that is increasing the length of your Achilles tendon and or the, um, the calcaneus bone itself when you have a valgus of your ankle. And second one is transferring a tendon which is uh, kind of not uh, helping your gait motion. So we uh, change the direction of the tendon so that it helps you walking. All these surgical procedures can be um, implemented in the model application and you can predict what the model, uh, the outcomes will be of these surgeries. So for this project we have developed a model for the right foot only. It has three segments of the feet shown in three different colors here. That is hind foot, that is calcaneus, talus, uniforms and the cuboid bones joined together. Five metatarsals are joined together to form the four foot joint. Five phalanges are joined to form toes joint. The femur and shank are included in the model just so that we can define the muscle origin points. The muscles which pass through the ankle joints have their origin points in tibia as well as femur. The muscle, uh, the model has 16 muscles and 14 ligaments. So now that I've talked about the introduction of gear analysis and why we need the foot model, I'm going to start with the steps involved in developing a base model. The first step in developing the base model is defining the segment. Um, for that, to define a segment, we define the coordinate system of each segment and then define the inertial properties of each segment. To compute the inertial properties, we assume each bone to be cylindrical measure the radius in orthonormal direction and use those to compute the inertial properties. Um, after doing that, we attach a CT scan image to each segment to give a graphical representation of the model. So once we have all the bones in the model, then we want to include all the muscles and ligaments spanning across the joints. Muscles are defined by insertion points and the wire points through which they pass, and we need to define them next to define the muscles and the ligaments. So, for example, we are trying to define tibialis anterior muscles here. So, assume that it passes through this anatomical landmark 
on the tibia and the insertion point is an anatomical landmark on the first nerve artery. So this is the uh, image of a CT scan from a single subject. We, we open these images into a image analysis program such as Meshworks. We can measure the position of these anatomical landmarks from this program. These coordinate system that you see on this picture here are in the coordinate system of this uh, image. Those coordinate system needs to be transformed into coordinate system of each segment to which this, this anatomical landmark is attached to. For example, this marker, red marker, is the point which is depicted here. This will be transformed into the uh, shank coordinate system. This um, point right here will be transformed into the four foot coordinate system. And once we have defined these wire points and the insertion point of the muscle, we define the muscles to pass through these points. Once we have defined the muscle and ligament geometry and the bone geometry in the model, we want to introduce the model parameters, which are muscle and the ligament parameters. The, for the muscle, the first parameter is maximum force, that is how much force a muscle can produce and it is maximally active. These parameters are well known for the ankle muscles because these models have been developed already, but uh, some of them are not well developed for the various muscles of the feet. So for those muscles, it was set as a proportion to the cross-sectional area of the muscles. And these cross-sectional areas were taken from a cadaver study by Kira in 1997 in which he did a study on 11 cadaver feet. And he came as the cross-section area, muscle fiber length, penetral length, and and those parameters were used for fiber length and penetration angles as well. The fiber ratios of the muscles, some of them are well known, and most of them are from in the range of 0.4 to 0.6. Uh, if those parameters were not available in literature, we assumed it to be 0 0.5. Uh, same goes for the ligament. There are three parameters to define the ligament, yield force, yield strain, and slack length. And these three parameters were taken from cadaver studies done by Siegler and Wright. Now, once we had defined the model geometry, we wanted to measure the movement arm of a muscle. Same here, for example, we are trying to measure the movement arm of a tibialis anterior muscle. So, um, we start with ankle joint at the most flexed position, that is when this ankle flexion angle is 60 degrees. And we have let the ankle joint move in the extension direction from 60 degrees towards 110 degrees. So this position represents this point right here on the graph at the x-axis of ankle flexion angle. And it goes through this motion and finally stops under 10 degrees, which is this position right here. At each instant during this motion, it measures how much the length of the tendon has changed uh, and divided by how, by how much the angle of the joint has changed. And this ratio uh, defines the movement arm of that muscle. And we measure that movement arm at each and every point of the angle flexion motion. And the y-axis is the movement arm in meters. So the blue line here is the movement arm measured in the model. And the red line here represents the movement arm which was measured in a cadaver study done by school in 1990. And what you can see here is these two lines do not match. So the model movement arm is not the same as the movement arm which is measured in the cadaver. So what that means is that our model is not anatomically accurate. It doesn't represent the normal anatomy yet. So to take care of that, we did a movement arm optimization in which we use the function which is any opt study which is inbuilt in any script. The design with Variable, that is, the values that we are trying to optimize here are the position of the muscle wire points shown by this red point right here. This wire point was allowed to move in plus minus one centimeter in three directions, x, y, x, y, and z. Any design measure which was optimized in function was the difference in the movement on, the movement on measured by the model minus the movement arm measured by the cadaver at each and every angle flexion. And we take the summation of that and minimize that those that value over a range of motion. So this is what happens after optimization. 
This is the moment turn before optimization. The line with the circle is moment on from the cadaver. In line with the triangular point is the moment on from after optimization. So what you can see here that these lines are closer together. So model is more anatomically accurate. So moment arms are closer to the moment on measured by the cadaver in the cadaver. So, so what this uh, optimization is doing here is that when we define the muscle y point, we define following an anatomy text that says that the muscle passes through this anatomical landmark on this bone. So we measure that position of the anatomical landmark, which is right on top of the bone. And we define the muscle, which is just a string, which doesn't have any uh, width associated with it. Um, but in reality, tendon is not a thin line. It, it's usually one to two centimeter thick, and there is a soft tissue surrounding that tendon in most of the times. So what is optimization is doing is that it's, it's adjusting the model uh, geometry to take care of those offsets due to tendon thickness and soft tissue surrounding the tendon. So after the optimization model represents, um, uh, reflects the normal anatomy. This is, these are the results of the same moment of optimization process done for all, the, it was done for all the muscles. I'm showing you four different graphs. Um, first thing that I want you to observe here is that uh, x axis is ankle flexion angle, y axis is the moment arm for all four different sets of muscles. This, these lines, the plane line is the before optimization, circle line is the cadaver, and triangle line is the optimization. In all four cases, after optimization, these two lines get closer. And uh, optimization not only just shifts the movement arm from one vein into another, it also uh, makes sure that the movement arm follows the pattern which is which is observed in the cadaver. For example, this mono for example this monotonically increases over the range of motion, while in real it should be increasing and then decreasing. So after optimization, your movement arm follows the pattern that it should be following in the normal anatomy. Same goes for the extens extensor helices longus muscles and extensor digital and longus muscles and tibialis posterior muscles. Now that we have developed the model and made sure that the model reflects the normal anatomy, we can go on to the steps involved in adapting the model for subject specific application. So the first of all, the model is developed on the basis of a CT scan of a single subject for which the cadaver was available. The um, segment size needs to be adjusted for each subject height and weight. So we use the simplest scaling law to do that. Um, this is the geometric scaling. KL is the ratio of the subject height versus height of the cadaver from the CT scans are taken. Same goes for the KM, that is the ratio of the weight. Why we have this power to weight 3 is that the force is known to be proportional to the cross-sectional area and mass is proportional to the volume of the body. That's why this power of the weight 3. So once we have done that uniform scaling, the, to derive the model for the walking, we will have two distinct inputs. First one is a mark of trajectory measured by camera system, like how each and every mark is moving while subject is walking. And the second one is the ground reaction force, which is uh, how much force you are pushing while you step on the floor. So in this picture on the left here is the mark of trajectory collected by the motion camera system shown in white. And these are the marks of position attached to the segments in the model shown in black. So when we scale the model and move around the model so that it's as close to the marker as possible, this is what we got. You can see here is that black and white markers are not right next to each other. There is a separate difference in pretty much all the markers. And it's even more evident in the segments of the feet. So why is this happening? Why these two markers do not match? The first one is the marker placement error. That is, um, while putting on the markers, there is always a um, human error associated with where you place the markers on the bone. Um, second one is over-determinacy. That is, um, there are a lot 
more markers on each segment than there are degree of freedom to be adjusted. So the third one is more, we have defined some model joint constraints such as spherical joints at ankle and the forefoot and the value joints on the toes, which are um, probably not true in the normal anatomy. The last one is the probably uniform scaling does not apply. And what I mean by that is that even though uniform scaling usually applies for the long bones, it may not apply for feet. Even though your feet um, may uh, uh, have the same ratio as your height, but uh, your different segments of the feet may not scale by the same ratio. For example, the same feet length, one person may have longer metatarsal bones than another. So what that means is that we need to scale each and every segment separately instead of applying the same scaling law to each segment. The usual anybody approach to handling this poor determinacy is that by excluding some of the markers and we only use some of the uh, markers to define the degree of freedom of a segment. The method used here is the optimization method uh, for dealing with over determinacy which was developed by Dr. Michael Henderson and uh, the, even though for this project this part was separate program, it will be integrated in the next version of anybody 4.1. Uh, what this optimization does is that it enforces the joint constraints such as spherical joint or the revolute joint and the ankle forefoot and the toe joint. It optimizes each and uh, segment length, like each segment hind foot, forefoot and the toes and the marker position associated with each segment. And the optimization function, which is minimizing, is the difference between the marker trajectory. So at each, over a walking trial, each and every frame, it computes the difference between the markers from the camera system and the markers from the model. And some of that value is minimized in, using this optimization. Uh, another flexibility in that optimization algorithm is that you can choose which marker you want to optimize and which one you don't want to optimize. For example, this marker here is that we know in our clinical setting that this is anatomical landmark is easily identifiable, so that we are very confident about this position of this marker. So we do not optimize this. Off, off, off means the marker position is not optimized in any of the three directions. On the other hand, for example, this marker, we are confident about the next y position, but we uh, think there might be an error in z direction of this marker, therefore we optimize the z direction of this marker. Some of the markers which are highly prone to the marker placement error were optimized in all three directions. So this slide shows the results after optimization. This is marker position before optimization. Black is the marker associated with the model. White is the marker trajectory measured by the camera system. So what optimization has done is that it adjusted the segment size in the black marker position so that it matches the white marker position. And you can see that after optimization, all the markers lie right next to each other. Now that we apply the scaling law, the scale law more like according to the marker data, now we need the ground reaction force which we can apply at the each segment at the bottom to do the inverse dynamic analysis. What's different in this model is that traditionally for this model of the segment segment. So we need only one ground reaction force because that's the only segment in contact with the ground while walking. And which is usually measured by a force plate embedded in the ground. But in, in our case, we have <coughs> separated the feet into three different segments, hind foot, forefoot, and toes. So that, and all these three segments are in contact with the ground at some point within the stand phase of the gate cycle. Therefore, we need three different ground reaction Vectors for these three segments which is not possible by just single force plate measures. So, uh, to solve that problem, we have a setup in which we have mounted a pair of bar graph, which is a pressure plate mounted on top of a force plate so that we measure the same walking trial and the data collection on these two force plates and the pair of bar graph is synchronized. So, uh, to the force plate and the pair of bar graph start collecting data at the same instant. So this here shows <coughs> the data, output data from the pair of bar graph after the pressure part, uh, summation of the gate cycle. We, are, we only wanted to look at one 
um, data items. So we draw a region of interest and we only uh, include this data on our analysis, subtract this. So this is what we get. In the next step, we divide this fresh hair form into three different segments by drawing region of interest on hind foot, fore foot, and toes. So from that, we can divide the ground direction for into three different segments shown here in three different arrows. The red represents the dark gray area here, light gray is the green, and white is the blue. From, from these two, we, we not only get the three different uh, force vector, we also can calculate the center of pressure for three different segments from this pressure graph. So once we have that, we are almost ready for doing the inverse kinetic analysis. There is one more step left. That is tendon ligament length calibration. There are two methods of doing that. One is static calibration in which we define the joint position um, and then compute the tendon length at that position and set that to be the set slack length. For example, um, you can say that the gastroc muscle is at this at slack position while your knee is flexed at 90 degrees. So you move the model to the knee to the 90 degrees, measure your tendon length and set that to be a slack length. Another second method is a dynamic method in which your model goes through a range of motion so that the model segment goes through a range of motion of one gait cycle. We measure the origin insertion length of a muscle and ligament over this range of cycle and then set the slack length to be mean of this range. And uh, we have tried both these methods on in this model, and we have seen that the dynamic model, dynamic method is much more, um, much more efficient in this case. It leads to the lesser uh, um, overactivity of the muscles. So now we have developed the base model, adapted the model for the subject-specific application. Now we need to compute the model outcomes, which is the muscle forces uh, produced by each muscle which to move that uh, move each segment during the gait cycle. And for that we've used the min-max algorithm uh, which was um, implemented in the antibody system itself. Um, it was developed by Dr. Rasmussen in which we minimize the maximum muscle activity. This part right here is the muscle activity. This is the muscle force at each instant. And Ni is a normalization factor, which is the instantaneous muscle strength. The maximum of, of these muscle um, activity were minimized. And the optimization function is subject to these two equations. First one is the equation of motion, that is C is the matrix of cohesion depending on the current position of the segments. F is the unknown forces, that is the muscle forces, and the joint reaction forces. And R is a known force, that is external forces, that ground reaction forces that we have computed, and the inertial forces. We also apply them positively constrained, that is muscles can only pull, they cannot push, so we enforce that the muscle force will always be positive. So to summarize here, the subject specific application involves these five steps. We collected the marker data on five pediatric controls. Subjects for which the norm average age was about 10 years. We computed the three ground reaction forces for each and every subject. We applied the optimization routine to scale the model so that they match the marker trajectory in the camera system. We did the dynamic tendon and ligament length calibration for one gait cycle. And finally, we computed the muscle activation level during walking. So these are the results. On the x-axis here is the gait cycle. This point right here will be the point at which your heel strikes the ground. Right here your toe comes off. And then here will be when your heel strikes the ground again. So that completes one gait cycle. On the y-axis is the activation level of the muscle at 100% means the muscle is activated at its maximum possible strength. The shaded part here is the activation pattern which was taken from literature which was noted by an electromyography that is you uh, insert the, uh, either a surface electrode or a fine wire electrode into the muscles and measure the activation pattern while the best walk. These 
they rise about average of about 20 to 50 subjects for each muscle. The five different lines in different colors is the model outcomes. We carry out the subject specific applications for that five different subjects, five trials. And what I want you to observe here is that um, the activation pattern matched very well with the activation pattern which were shown in the feature by the measure but directly from the subject by electromagnetography. So uh, you can observe that the soleus and gas clock muscles are active at the late stem phase. TBLS and anterior muscles get is activated right at the heel strike, and then it goes off and then it's active again during the same phase. Same goes for TBLS posterior, peronis, various peronis, longus muscles. They all follow the same pattern which was measured by EMG. And they may not uh, qualitatively compare, that is, it is not exactly the 40%, but qualitatively they follow the same form of the muscle activation. The next is the two flexor extensor muscles. And in the earlier slide, was, I was talking about the ankle muscles, the muscles which across, span across the ankle joint. In this case also, flexor rhizotome and flexor halysis, longus muscles, they both are active. Um, at the late span phase, and uh, we find the maximum activity at the toe off instant for uh, flexor halysis longus muscles. Uh, you can see that here that model uh, outcomes did not compare well with the uh, EMG activation pattern for extensor and halysis to the toe longus muscles. Uh, the reason for this might be that uh, we recruited the muscles only to drive the motion in the sagittal plane. And why we decided to do that is that because we, the movement arm data was available for flexion extension motion of the ankle only. So we did the optimization for that only. So we are only sure of our model geometry and flexion extension motion. Therefore, we are driving the muscles only for flexion extension sagittal plane motion. The, mu the muscles are not uh, active to drive the motion in uh, non sagittal plane motion, that is inversion, inversion, or the internal external, external rotation. Um, Dragus muscles, which we cannot reach by EMG activation, therefore there is no shaded graph here. So that is, so the model provides the first insight into this activation pattern of these Dragus muscles. Uh, so there is external digitorum Dragus, digitorum longus, helices Dragus, helices longus. Uh, we can see that the, the activation pattern is similar between longus muscles and the brevis muscles. So, and the same goes for the flexor muscles. The activation pattern is similar between longus and the brevis muscles. So what we have found here is that brevis muscles act as an associate of the longus muscles. They um, have the same activation pattern as the longus muscles. Um, so coming to the end, concluding, so this is our first step towards developing multi-segments food model which can be used for clinical settings. There are a lot more that needs to be done. And uh, we have shown that the movement arm optimization improves anatomical accuracy by uh, making sure that the uh, muscle movement arm compare well with the movement arms measured in cadaver. Um, the marker optimization, marker position optimization uh, shows the su subject specific application as possible and the um, steadiness of this op optimization routine was well tested by five different data sets from five different subjects. The model outcomes match very well for most muscles with EMG activation pattern qualitatively, but we need more cadaver testing data, that is we need more movement arm data for non sagittal plane motion so that we can optimize the model geometry for in other two planes and then we can use the, the model to compute the model activation pattern in other two directions too. So that concludes my presentation here. There's a quick announcement that the next webcast will be on December 3rd and um, Dr. Ro John Rasmussen will be talking about use of motion capture data. That is um, the method that I talked about of marker optimization it has been implemented in next version of anybody and uh, there should be much more than that. Um, and he'll be talking about that. At this point, I would like to thank my fellow authors, Dr. Brooks Black Williams, who is my advisor and the director of the Motion Analysis Lab in Solid City, and Dr. Michael Anderson, who has helped us 
uh, develop this uh, optimization method specifically for food. At this point, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for paying attention.